Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Board of County Commissioners. Boy, this mic is something else. Um, Board of County Commissioners meeting of uh, Thursday, March 22nd. We please uh, like to call the meeting to order. Please join and uh, uh, stand with me to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I have one announcement for us and maybe there are others by staff. Uh, tonight there will be a public open house on our updated community wildfire protection plan for Missoula County in this very room from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. This is a pretty important plan for the county and I would uh, uh, certainly invite any and all of you to join if you are interested and able. Any other uh, announcements? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to public comment on items not on today's agenda and we uh, come on up. We have three agenda items today that you can see on your uh, uh, agenda, uh, three public hearings, but if there's anything else that's not listed, this is the time to offer public comment. Mr. Sadler. Yes, my name is Jim Sadler. I live at um 1220 Clemens Road, and I'm a member of the Western Montana Shrine Club, and I want to announce to, uh, to you and the public that the Shrine Club is having a, uh, a walk-a-thon at our regional park on June 9th. This is a replacement a fundraiser. Uh, for 72 years, we held a Shrine Circus in, uh, in Missoula, and because of events, uh, that is no longer possible. So we have... Um, come up with the idea for this uh, a walkathon at, at the regional park and so everybody's invited those who participate uh, in it will share in a barbecue afterwards and we'll ha be having entertainment it should be a, a fun day so everybody's invited to come out the, it starts at seven in the morning the uh, the proceeds uh, will be a uh, be used uh, for to help um, uh, children with orthopedic uh, issues. We'll be having a, a clinic there for, uh, for um, if anybody has a child that has um, uh, orthopedic issues, we, we can make an appointment for you. Uh, many folks think that, that this is only for people who are uh, very low income, and that's not true. That many uh, working families have insurance policies with high deductibles. And uh, and, the, and the hospitals will take the children with uh, with the high deductibles, pay the deductible, and then um, uh, bill the insurance. So, uh, and also the local clubs will uh, will pay for uh, transportation and motels room while you're in Spokane. So it's a wonderful thing, and our community has supported this effort for over 72 years, and I hope that will continue to do so. So thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any other public comment on items not on today's agenda? Okay, seeing none, our current claim list, and this would be for claims received as of March 2nd, 2018 to March 15th, 2018 by the Commissioner's Office, total $2,868,136.15. As I mentioned, we have three public hearings today. The first is uh, on um, uh, sign sponsorship policy for Big Sky Park. I will open the public hearing and we have a staff report from John Stegmeyer. Thanks, Commissioner. My name is John Stegmeyer. I work for Missoula County's Parks, Trails, and Open Lands Program. And what I have today uh, under consideration for you, Commissioners, is a resolution looking for uh, permission to display off premise sponsorship signs at Big Sky Park. Um, this resolution would permit that and additionally adopt a governance policy for display of those signs. This is something that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, the, our park partners out of Big Sky Park have displayed a limited number of signs over the years uh, as a fundraising mechanism. The, the, the main thing that's come up um, in the last year is an understanding that the zoning for Big Sky Park does not allow sponsorship signs. And so what we've done is uh, worked through a process um, of public participation with the Big Sky Park Stewardship Committee, 
the members um, out there who hold uh, lease agreements with us and then went through a public forum process with the Zoning Board of Adjustment to uh, complete that step to deviate from zoning. What we think uh, most likely we're envisioning will, will be signs of this nature, um, fairly common Little League type signs, um, local businesses and the like will sponsor them. And then our policy defines exactly what's permissible and acceptable to display um, within fairly, I guess, we think fairly tight parameters. And that's essentially it. Um, any questions on what's being proposed? Um, can we take, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask, so the Board of Adjustment um, is rec agreed and is recommending, so the recommendation is coming. We don't usually see things from the Board of Adjustment, so I'm just trying to clear that up. So because this is county property and county zoning, that's why it's coming to us. Yeah, well, um, technically all we need to do to do this is go before the Board of Adjustments and um, complete the public forum. There was There is actually no decision or recommendation from that board, but um, just a, a legal step. This hearing provides one more opportunity for additional review and for public notice and public comment. So this is, um, I guess, just a little bit above and beyond just to make sure that if there was any um, dispute or any issues that people would have another chance to contest it because the public forum really doesn't offer that opportunity. Did anyone offer comment at the Board of Adjustments? We just heard from the president of the Big Sky Stewardship Committee with support for moving forward um, from the basis that this is really a pretty commonplace fundraise, fundraising tool for uh, Little Leagues and other partners out at the park. We didn't hear any opposition. We didn't receive any mail-in comments either from uh, a mailer that we did to the park neighbors. Okay, thanks. Cola? Could you just contextualize it really quickly with what the current situation is? There are no signs allowed, or they can face in, or they have to be really small, or? Essentially, the way I understand the zoning is you, with that zoning, you can't have commercial signage at all. Um, but because the signs that have been out there to date have been pretty limited and only up for a short amount of time, or they're in the American Legion complex, so they're fully enclosed. You'd have to be a participant or um, a paying spectator to be exposed to the marketing and the signage for that complex. It's never really been an issue until um, recently one of the newer leaseholders out there came to us and said, just want to get approval for this, and we reviewed the zoning and found out that actually it's not consistent with zoning. So this is a public hearing. Is there any public comment on the proposed Big Sky Park sponsorship sign policy? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any additional questions from the commission? Uh, one, one question I have, uh, and I just noticed this this morning, in the exemption section, the last sentence, and this would be page three of the policy, the last sentence states additional exceptions to this policy may be necessary and will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Who is it that's considering that on a case-by-case -case basis? Parks and Trail staff? Yeah, so we, the way it's written is that uh, any of the partners out there that we have a, a lease agreement with submit a proposal to staff and and there's an initial staff review. If things are straightforward and consistent with the policy, we imagine that, uh, or we're envisioning that staff would, at that point, say, okay, go ahead with signage. Um, if there's anything that needs further review, it would go through the Parks and Trails Advisory Board for consideration. And then uh, from there, you know, if, if there was further debate, it would go up to the commission. So ought that to be spelled out in the policy just like you described? 
Uh, I just wonder, there's some ambiguity here in terms of who is actually considering it in the process by which that would sure. be considered. Sure, yeah, and I can do that. Um, I think, you know, earlier on, um, and this was uh, this particular part of the exceptions was something I was requested to do from the Parks and Trails Advisory Board, and this was the language that I believe that they had approved and recommended, so that's what I kept with if there needs to be additional um, clarification as to who and, and what is granting that permission that I can add that in. Commissioner, it looks like if you look at the um, top of page two under procedure, it talks about giving this to staff, so maybe that covers it. But you, you could add by staff. I mean, when it's simple and administrative, there's no need to involve us, and they already bring things to us. But do you think that covers it, or would you like the last sentence to also say we consider on a case by case basis? Case by case basis by the parks, trails, and open lands staff. Just I, I think that would make it more clear. If that something of that nature sure. sounds acceptable. Okay. So my other question is, um, John, is our um, motion to adopt the resolution with the attached policy? Is that kind of what the motion should read? Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, the way I, I wrote the, re the resolution um, grants the permission to okay. display signs, and then the, the policy is um, accompanying. So yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Any additional questions or a motion? I would move that the Board of County Commissioners approve the um, resolution regarding um, off-premise sponsorship signs at Big Sky Park and adopt the governance policy for the terms of the display um, and amend attachment A to um, include, maybe it'd be easier to start over. Maybe we should do the amendment first, just so it's easier to take the minutes. So I would move that we amend the um, attachment A to the proposed policy uh, on page three under exceptions to add to the very last sentence by Missoula County Parks, Trails, and Open Land staff, period. Okay. Second. Any additional discussion on the uh, amended language? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then I would move that the Board of County Commissioners adopt the resolution to approve the display of off-premise sponsorship signs at Big Sky Park and adopt a governance policy shown as attachment A as amended for the terms of display. Second. Any additional discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. Yep. Appreciate it. Uh, keep us posted on how the policy plays out. So. It probably will evolve. It's my best guess. Oh, okay, it will evolve, he says. Uh, all right, uh, our second public hearing, uh, which I'll open, is on amending Chapter 8 of Missoula County Subdivision Regulations, and these would be uh, maintenance amendments, and we have a staff report from uh, Community and Planning staff, uh, Jenny Dixon. Thank you. Um, so this is a hearing for amendments to Chapter 8, the subdivision exemption regulations. And um, I wanted to just make you aware that I, um, upon entering this, this afternoon, I received uh, two pages of questions from Territorial Land Works who did not have a, an opportunity to look at the email that had the proposed changes that we sent out last November. And so because of that, I would like to offer up the options to put this hearing last um, after the other hearing because it may take a while to go through Territorial's questions. Um, also, there's no statutory deadline to act on this change and we could also take an opportunity to do the hearing, open the hearing, close the hearing, and then I could meet with Misty 
shortly, and then we could reschedule the hearing for another time. I just don't want to take your time trying to answer Misty two pages of questions from Misty during the hearing, unless you're okay with that. Commission, what's your prerogative? It's been a lot of time since November, but uh, uh, are they sort the sorts of things that we could sort out on the floor here, uh, or? Um, I think there, a lot of them have um, not very definitive answers and warrant discussion. And so that was my reason for suggesting that we could at least let the other hearing go first if, if it's going to take some time. I mean, the other option certainly would be to open the public hearing, take comment, um, keep the public hearing open, and uh, at our uh, subsequent public meeting, uh, wrap it up. That is another option. And, and we could take the comment, and Misty can get her questions on the record, but I don't know that we can answer them all here today. And we could, I could meet with her separately and then come back for another okay. hearing on this. Uh, commissioners? Jean? Do you feel that the, it's not just questions that may, all, may make substantive changes to the document, depending on where that discussion goes, or is it, I don't, what do you recommend, I, just, I guess, based yeah, on what that? Um, I, I think it's just a matter of trying to answer the questions to their satisfaction. I don't envision it making changes really to the document, um, but that's, that's kind of remains to be seen, I guess. Jean. I think that it would be good for us to um, open the hearing, have you give your explanation and presentation as planned. Okay. And then, um, you know, potentially that's going to answer some questions that may seem confusing when they haven't been explained. And then we can um, okay. recess the hearing and continue it with you and Misty having time to go over her stuff specifically. You bet. Okay. I mean, she can still ask questions of us too, but. Okay, without objection, that is what we will uh, do right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I know there's a little slide. It's right there. There it is. Okay. Um, so, as I said, this is a proposal to do what we call maintenance amendments to Chapter 8, Subdivision Exemption Regulations. The major rewrite of these regulations occurred about a year and a half ago, took effect November 1st, 2016. We've been operating with the, those new exemption regulations for about a year and a half, and so far it's, it seems to be working quite well. There have been, over the last year and a half, um, instances where we've made note that we could make improvements or there's been some confusion and, and some clarification is needed. And so that is generally what we're presenting to you today. The um, packet that you received from our office shows the proposed changes in an underlying strikeout format. And while there are a lot of um, underlying and strikeout, there are really only about 12 or so substantive changes. The rest of them are just kind of changing uh, words to have very little effect, I mean, or very little consequence. Um, this, these amendments are not required to have a planning board public hearing. So this is the first hearing on these, and as I mentioned earlier, there is no statutory deadline to take effect, um, or excuse me, statutory deadline to, for you to take action. But when you do take action, they are um, in effect immediately. Our uh, notification process started last fall where we reached out to agencies in October, took about a month to solicit their comments and respond to their requests. And um, in, on November 22nd, then we sent it out for comment to uh, a list of about 800 email addresses that we contact for all of our amendments. We had anticipated a public hearing in January um, on this, and so we'd asked for public comment to be back by um, early January, but that hearing date did not materialize. And so there's been um, about three months um, of opportunity to comment. but. Um, as far as you know, opportunities th that people may not have seen the email. So I think that may have been what happened with this situation that I mentioned earlier. So we, we are trying to respond to all comments that we receive. And we have received some public comment that is attached to your packet. Um, the purpose of exemptions is to accommodate exceptional circumstances when full plenary subdivision review is unnecessary. And that gives you um, discretion to review exemptions based on evasion criteria and rebuttable presumptions that are in the regulations. I'm going to just hit on some highlights of our changes, uh, the substantive changes. The first six 
Um, well, I'm not going to hit on very, very in depth. Um, we are uh, making the change to the definition of agriculture just for a clarification to match state law. We are proposing that the effective date of November 4th, 2016 apply to all exemptions um, retroactively, but, but the um, net effect of that is that really those that have been approved, all they really have to do um, is, fi is filing and recording of their documents, and so these new regulations will help clarify how to do that. The third one is um, the condo townhome exemption right now requires that a, a condo townhome development comply with an approved subdivision site plan and um, we're adding in the option to, all, to instead of that uh, comply with zoning as an alternative. We've um, added or relaxed several submittal requirements. We've added an ability to make minor amendments to an approved um, exemption such as uh, when they present a, an application for an exemption they may anticipate uh, a family transfer tract for example having one and a half acres and later they decide they want to do one and three quarters acres or you know uh, some and and generally in the same location when there's a change of um, recipient or or a total change of location then that's more of a major amendment but we do want to get it in the regulations that you can do a minor change without having to go back through the review. Um, the surveyor's office and I think the clerk and recorder's office both requested to have the approval date of an exemption on instruments of transfer so that we know when the two-year holding period for family transfers expires. Uh, the more substantive changes are the number seven through 12. And I'm gonna just go through those here for a minute. Um, the, one of them is adding the uh, a, a clarifying a general evasion criterion about the development pattern. Is there a development pattern that's created through this exemption? And um, this language is in there now, but it's I wanted to to write it in a different way so that it was kind of clear. It's you know this this and or this can be indicative of the exemption setting up a development pattern that would appear to be a subdivision, and those three development pattern indic indicators are the division effects or results six or more tracks, um, the overall development plan of the exemption proposal appears to be equivalent to a subdivision. And third, the division fits with a previously established pattern of land divisions, meaning subdivisions, in the, in the nearby vicinity. We're proposing some clarifications to mortgage exemption. In particular, the, um, we've had requests people want to re reuse the surveys that have been drafted for mortgage exemptions that have either been foreclosed upon or have been satisfied and in an attempt to kind of save the expense of doing another survey, here are some situations where a prior survey can be used uh, in a new exemption request. And the first situation is when a mortgage has been satisfied. If the same party comes forward with a request for a subsequent mortgage review um, on that prop property, then th we would not need to review it again for a subdivision exemption. If the property has been foreclosed upon and they want to use that um, survey, then the subsequent mortgage exemption can uh, only occur when it's completed by an institution institutional lender. And then finally, the um, memorializing of the, the, the county current county policy that if a mortgage tract was conveyed prior to October 1, 2003, then both the mortgage and remaining tracts um, do not, not any longer need to go through exemption review to be transferred. Uh, the fourth one is, um, or I think maybe this is the third one, the boundary line relocation. We are adding a new rebuttable presumption that accounts for situations where there may be shifting of boundary lines that result in the creation of new tracts that are 320 acres or greater, as this presents an opportunity to divide that tract without review. Um, thereby creating a, a possibility for additional building sites that did not exist previously. We are clarifying uh, a rebuttable presumption in the family transfer exemption section um, where it talks about creating a, um, 
an exemption for transfer to a straw man, and some indicators of that may be that the grantor or recipient owns other land, tracts of land in Missoula, and, um, and or recipients do not intend to reside on the family transfer tracts. Keep in mind that all of the general evasion criteria and the rebuttable presumptions um, work together to paint the bigger picture. Uh, there's no one single criterion or rebuttable presumption that is going to necessarily lead you to conclude evasion. You look at the whole picture. And so there may be some concern about um, do these criteria or the rebuttable presumptions, if we meet it, does it mean we don't get it? And what I've tried to explain is that, no, that's not necessarily the case. We look at all factors that would lead you to conclude there's evasion or there's not evasion. The second major change or um, significant change to family transfers is we're incorporating an alternative method to allow for transfer of tracts to minors um, other than putting it into a trust. And that's some new information that came to us regarding the Montana Uniform Transfers to Minor Act. Um, one of our, our next proposal is to require the re that remaining tracts less than 160 acres be surveyed when they create the exempt tract. And there are a couple uh, compelling reasons for this, um, supported by our uh, various county agencies, um, because when remaining tracts are not surveyed, it can create a situation where legal descriptions are questionably, well, are in, can be inaccurate or at least very difficult to ascertain. And so this proposal will clarify the public record and increase our, our ability and title company's ability to produce factually correct legal descriptions. It reduces the, the frequency of those questionable legal descriptions and it places the financial responsibility on the landowner creating that situation or requesting the exemption and not um, distributing that burden to taxpayers. And then finally, um, the, the other substantive changes are to allow for a change of the grantor uh, to, in the event of the grantor's death, after a family transfer approval. And this situation is, has come up, um, and we have allowed this to, to happen, um, where a grantor passes after the family transfer has been approved, but the recipients are still expecting transfer of their the tracts to them, and the estate of that deceased person can transfer the tracts to the recipients. We also wanted to build in the opportunity to allow for recipients to swap tracts, not adding any new recipients because we would need to review for evasion in that situation. But if if parents are giving it to children and they designate on their application, this one's going to Joe, this one's going to Mary, they are allowed to swap um, without having to go back to review. And then finally clarifying that the two-year holding period expires if an exemption is granted by the commissioners and the family transfer tract is transferred out of the recipient's ownership. If you recall, there are some situations where you can grant exceptions that will add owners onto a family transfer tract in the case of a marriage. Um, if, that, if that situation occurs, that two-year holding period still remains intact for the remaining two years because the original recipient is still on the title. If the exception is granted because that person had <laughs> dire economic situation and they need to sell it and you grant approval for that, the person who buys that tract is no longer obligated to that two-year holding period. Okay, so we wanted to make some clarifications. Um, CAPS is recommending approval of the Chapter 8 changes as shown in your attachment C. I did put some clarifying language on your desks this afternoon. Um, Again, very minimal changes uh, that I want to make sure that you incorporate when you make your motion, but you can follow the same motion when you're ready to do so. And I am happy to answer any questions, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jamie. This is a public hearing. Is there any public comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 8 of the Missoula County Subdivision Regulations? Okay, seeing on we'll, uh, Oh, we've got some hands coming up. and. Come on up to the microphone. Uh, please state your name for the record. I'm 
Chris Johnson. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm an attorney at Warden Thane, and I'm not here representing any particular client. Some of the things, given the time frame that you talked about, I may actually talk to Jenny separately because I do have some technical things in here that are less policy oriented and perhaps more appropriate for her attention, uh, similar to the stuff you got from uh, Territorial. But I did have a few things to uh, address here, some of which do touch and concern uh, work that I do on a regular basis. First off, I this has been in the in the in the exemption provisions for a long time and and it's the stated purpose to not provide a means of creating new building sites without subdivision review and i would suggest to this body that 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 purpose is one that's never articulated in state law and that you're kind of creating your own purpose that may be contrary to, to what state law is. State law is, is relatively silent, although I must admit I've not been through the legislative history of these exemptions to see whether there's some kind of evidence of it at the legislature. But that provision or that purpose is nothing that's stated in, in state law as a, as a general matter of course. Uh, in the general evasion criteria, I wanted to mention an issue that came up not in the county but within the city. The 201 exemptions, in, in particular, uh, uh, 201 1A, and I'm referencing the Montana statutes, uh, makes the provision for court ordered sales, and yet it seems that those uh, 201 1A provisions are all subject to evasion criteria or evasion review, and it doesn't seem to make a lot. And it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I mean, they're all. It seems to indicate that all 201. Uh, exemptions are subject to the evasion criteria, but the 201 1A stuff, which is court order divisions or divisions reached by agreement with an entity that's capable of 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, eminent domain, obviously would not be subject to, to evasion criteria. And the, and the issue came up in the city with a with an with a struck agreement and a division associated with a with a uh, a deal with a, a school district and and. Uh, you know, it, it it struck me as ironic. That was the first time it came it came across it. It's like, why 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 would evasion criteria uh, apply to these criteria or in these matters, uh, including including the uh, especially the eminent domain stuff, but also the uh, court ordered divisions. Uh, and it's just a you know it's just kind of an issue in the in the statutes. Maybe that statute, maybe the two hundred one one A would be better off as its own standalone standalone statute. Uh, in the books, but it makes it difficult to just simply say because of that one that all 201, uh, all 201 divisions or exemptions are subject to evasion criteria. So that's a little bit of the issue. Uh, it helped that Jenny and I've not had a chance to talk to her about her in mentioning uh, 8.5 subpart A, the new part that essentially sets us up as ex post facto. There's always an issue with with any kind of retroactive application of a of a new newly adopted thing, although Jenny indicated that there's a more targeted purpose for that, and that is a circumstance where you may have an approval that hadn't been finalized or recorded yet. Is that correct? I, I'd suggest to you that may be a legitimate purpose for, for a reach back or an ex post facto application of this, but you'd need to be a little more targeted uh, uh, or narrower, a little more narrow tailoring of that ex post facto application. I mean, technically, you'd look at this and somebody Somebody who had done a family transfer, you know, a couple of years ago, you'd read this and say the recording requirements say X, Y, and Z, and it's like, oh, do we have to go back and amend our deeds? I mean, we're not in compliance with the with the statute at this point. So the I'd suggest the purpose she mentioned for that is a valid purpose, but the the breadth of that of that application provision I think may be a little overly broad, and again uh, reaches into ex post facto issues that can always be a concern. Uh, Technical stuff, technical stuff that I'll talk to Jenny about if I can find, if and when we find the time. The, uh, a typo. The reservation of life estate stuff, uh, there's a there's a provision in the, that's not one of your proposed changes, and I'm, I'm a little reluctant to bring up stuff that, that's not subject to this, but there is a statement in there in the Reservation of Life Estate that says life estates as permitted by Montana Code Annotated 70, Chapter 15. That section doesn't permit anything. It defines life estates, future interests, uh, all that sort of thing. It's, it's really a, a, an estate in land definitional section. And, and the header on the 8.6.5 references the subdivision exemption that does permit exemptions for life estates. So it's it's kind of a kind of a typo thing. And again, I 
don't mean to bring stuff that's outside the proposed changes, but it seems like it's it's potentially a little bit of an error. Of the other thing that's that's noteworthy and that I work in on a somewhat regular basis, although rarely, more rarely in the county, are the exemptions associated with uh, townhomes or condominiums. And as been and as has been stated to this body before, when I think. Uh, Townhome regulations were in the were in the offing in the first place. There's not a lot of county property out there that qualifies for this exemption, as a as a matter of course. But the one thing that caught my attention on this, and this is something I've wrestled with with this with the, both the city and the county relative to this issue, arises in section. If you'll give me one moment. I was flipping, and you never flip to the exact page you're looking for. And don't feel too much pressure, uh, uh, since we will be leaving the public hearing open, right. uh, there will be time to revisit it. Give me one second, and it's, it's really the only thing that I, that I wanted to point out of here. I could go to the table of contents and that's why they have numbers on these things, right, to help, them, to help you find them? What are you looking for? Perhaps I can. In the townhome um, section. Oh, okay. Eight six ten. Eight six ten. Page yeah, eight. Glory by it. Okay. The issue is, and I've seen this through this process, and it's a con it's a, a little bit of a confusion about the various regulatory processes. But in 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 eight six ten three relative to recording. In subpart B, it calls for the, the usual stuff that, that's right out of state law about what needs to accompany uh, any, any recorded uh, uh, declaration or creation under the Unit Ownership Act. But it mentions certification from Public Works Department that the project has been completed to the approved design standards and specs and supporting geotechnical analysis. That's an area that I suggest to you falls under building permitting. And, and it falls squarely under building permitting. And it's an issue I've seen before where there are, are certain, uh, there are certain regulatory elements that make way more sense being part of the building permitting than they do as part of the, uh, the subdivision uh, exemption process. And I'd suggest to you that that's, that that's one of those issues. What happens in, in one regard or a minor element associated with this relative to sanitation review if, for instance, the project is on municipal sewer and water and is available to, to avail itself of the municipal facilities exclusion process instead of coastal review, they go through the MFE, it's pretty standard in the MFE process because that MFE process has to also indicate a, a stormwater, address stormwater issue. It's pretty standard for the, for the MFEs or for local government to say, uh, that these issues are addressed at building per permitting and at design review, which according to DEQ meets their criteria. Uh, and they check into it not only uh, facially in that there's a statement that says this element's reviewed at building permitting, but they follow up, or from what I've been told from DEQ, they follow up in reality. In other words, they know the city of Missoula, Missoula County is actually at their building permitting process and is actually looking at, at storm, whether stormwater is addressed and, and they're not just paying lip service to it. So that's an example of something that falls outside the review process prior to the townhome declaration and is more properly addressed at, at the time of building permitting and, and, and building review and inspection. And I'd suggest to you that this, that this also is, is in the same thing. If this is a, a prerequisite to being able to record a townhome declaration, it's very possible that a lot of projects aren't that far along that they're able to get such a certification from public works. I, again, I think that's entirely an appropriate element to be reviewing at the time of building permitting, but not necessarily at the time of the of the townhome declaration. Okay. okay. Other than that, just some other issues I talked to Jenny about. Okay. She has some time. Please do. Thank you. Touch. Thank yeah, thank you for uh, your thoughtful comments. Uh, additional public comment. Come on up. Uh, good afternoon, Josh Hilling, Territorial Landworks. 
Um, I believe most of these will just follow up with Jenny on after the fact, uh, just clarifications. Uh, I did have some concern regarding uh, the requirement to survey a remainder tract. I agree that there's a myriad of reasons where it's beneficial to and we should generally strive to as a rule. However, there are certain areas where due to topography and terrain, um, you know, Petty Creek, Paddy Canyon, areas like that, it's uh, not always cost effective to survey out a remainder, uh, just uh, could potentially double or triple the cost of a survey and basically uh, tank the potential project for a landowner. Uh, I guess I would like to see potentially some kind of exclusion to that rule where uh, if you can prove that uh, it's just, I guess, not, not cost effective and it's not going to cause too much issue with title. You know, we've all seen those parcels where the southwest quarter less this, that, and the other. We don't want to create any more of those that, than we need to, but uh, I guess I don't know that I like this as a hard, fast rule either. So uh, be nice to discuss that potentially. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. So just to put on the record, we talked about this a little bit um, yesterday, I think, as we sure. got a briefing on this. and. So what happens though is that you've got a piece up Patty Canyon that's kind of a pain in the neck to, to do, and somehow you know ends up in somebody else's hands later. Title company comes in and goes, mm -hmm. this looks like a cockeyed thing, and and the the taxpayers end up paying for it because we end up with our surveyors trying to clarify that mess that was left. So that's kind right. of what we're trying to avoid. And I, I agree. I don't want to see a parcel with ten pieces accepted and added to it. Uh, if it's just an aliquot part and it's, you know, the southwest quarter or less portion A, is that reasonable at that point if you're not aliquot creating a massive title issue? Um, but yeah, I don't know how you might quantify it, you know, once you reach three or four pieces that are accepted or accepted from or attached to, that starts to be a little unreasonable, I believe. So uh, perhaps some, there's some criteria that could be attached, uh, attached to that. Excuse me. Okay, okay thank you. That makes sense. Absolutely. And I should also say uh, this will probably be a point of further discussion. Uh, uh, by some accounts, state law does not uh, allow much flexibility in that these remaining tr tracks must actually be surveyed. So we'll be taking that up further. Additional public comment at this time. Okay, any uh, questions from the commission at this time, uh, recognizing we'll keep the public hearing open? Um, and in the interest of, I think if we can pick a date, then... Uh, how much time do you think, in a few weeks, uh, like early April, or uh, what do you... I think um, the second meeting in April would be ideal if April. it's not filled yet. April 12th, uh, Sarah? April 26th. Or no, let's see here. Is that what it is? Jenny, will that work? April 26th. Works fine. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue it till then. Sure, that would be great. So if anyone here uh, did not comment but uh, has uh, some additional thoughts on the matter, please tie in with uh, Jenny Dixon and our uh, community planning services staff, and uh, we'd love to have you back on April 26th, uh, same location, same time. Thank you. Thank you. So our third and final public hearing today is to consider a resolution of intention to create a special fairgrounds district. And I will turn it over to Emily Bentley, our director of the fairgrounds for a staff report. Thanks, I'm a move around a lot, so it's easier for me to stand up. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I prepared a brief uh, presentation, although I do need a mouse. Where'd it go? I prepared a brief presentation about the Fairground Special District and Courtney Ellis, our bond counsel from Dorsey. Whitney will follow me with some information about why we are recommending this financing tool over others. Um, and Chris Lonsbury is here also to answer questions. So for some uh, background, oops. 
Uh, for some background for folks uh, in the uh, audience, um, the Missoula County Fairgrounds was bought by the Board of County Commissioners in 1913 for $16,000. Um, it was originally surrounded by farmland, and as Missoula grew, it became centrally located with easy access and a variety of uses. And after serving the community for over a century, this important public asset is in need of reinvestment uh, to preserve historical, historic agricultural ties to the community, create a unique identity, provide open space, enhance trails and connectivity to existing parks, schools, and other destinations, and improve land values and the desirability of adjacent properties. Our mission is to promote agriculture, education, culture, recreation, and community connection, and to reflect the beauty and history of Western Montana. And our mantra, and you've heard me say it probably hundreds of times by now, is being the physical space that embodies the diversity that we find in Missoula County itself, connecting our rural heritage with our urban vibrancy, midtown with the neighborhoods, and tradition with innovation. So before we get into uh, the discussion about cost estimates and mills and financing mechanisms, I think it's worth reminding ourselves why this old uh, tatty debated place is worth our collective heartache and precious resources. And we know that as citizens and leaders, we have a duty to be stewards of the community resources that have been entrusted to our care and to ensure that our cultural identity is preserved and passed down to future generations. Under your leadership, we now have the opportunity to demonstrate to our children how responsible adults find solutions to difficult challenges through hard work, creativity, and cooperation. So that hopefully, when their time comes, they in turn have the ability and feel the call to be careful stewards. On a local level, we should seek out and lift up common values that the good people in our community share. And the fairgrounds, fairgrounds is a space that encourages Missoula residents to reach outside their comfort zone and interact and solve problems with people who are different from them. And redeveloping the fairgrounds is part of that journey. And I can just say really quickly that on my short time on the job, I have been moved many times by the authenticity and grit that that place inspires. At last year's fair, 86,000 people came together from vastly different walks of life to celebrate community connection, shared heritage, and local agriculture. And in a crisis, 4-H families, county staff, and first responders worked together to keep people and livestock safe. And after the fire, the fair went on. And beyond the fair, the fairground says over 500 events a year. And that doesn't include the ice rinks, which run into from 4 a.m. until 1 a.m. all winter long. So redevelopment embraces and enhances that vital role that 4-H plays in our community to educate future generations of local farmers. Redevelopment realizes the critical role that the weed district plays in keeping our working landscapes pristine. Redevelopment recognizes that Missoula is top rank in the country of ice users per capita. And redevelopment will be a catalyst for investment in Midtown Missoula where there is tremendous economic activity bubbling under the surface waiting to be uncorked. So fairgrounds planning is uh, complete and we're moving into design. As you know, the county has invested a uh, significant time um, to reach this point. The master planning process, although it took some time, was fair and transparent and important difficult decisions were made. The community is behind you and ready to move forward. They're eager to see the vision articulated. Uh, so next month we'll release design guidelines with a schematic plan um, for public comment and, and hold a public hearing here with you. Um, and a little bit about that, um, starting last June, we held a series of workshops with stakeholders to begin designing the look and feel of the fairgrounds. Last August, during the Western Montana Fair, there was an interactive booth from community members to express their design preferences. And I just have to say that uh, that was such a positive experience. We had, I mean, people, person after person came by and told us how excited they are to see the fairgrounds moving forward. Um, and unlike the planning process, which focused on which uses would go where, um, the design guidelines are focused on style. The goal being to ensure that with so many varying uses, the entire 46 acres are integrated and attractive. And so here's a sneak peek of the schematic plan that's going to be released for public comment with the design guidelines in a few weeks. As we move forward, um, and use what we're learning on the ground in the face of budget realities, more and more details will emerge. So now into the weeds about the special district. And I hope this diagram um, helps folks understand a somewhat confusing tool. Um, so as you know, um, in the uh, fiscal year 1718 budget process last summer, 
the Missoula County Commission allocated three mills for fairgrounds redevelopment with the intent to combine them with an existing ongoing one half mill allocated to the county weed district and an existing an ongoing one half mill allocated to the county extension office for a total of four mills to be used annually to implement phase one of the master plan. This ongoing millage, which showed up on property owners taxes uh, last fall, will be used to pay the cost of the special district. To be clear, these mills are already on the tax bills of Missoula County residents. No additional tax increase is associated with the creation of this special district today. Likewise, the Missoula County Fairgrounds Special District will encompass only the county owned fairgrounds property. So there will be no uh, other property owners in the special district who would receive uh, a new um, tax assessment. So if we have the money, why do we need the special district? Well, at this time, construction costs are inflating at a much faster rate than interest rates are rising. Um, and therefore, spending, um, rather than spend the mills as cash one year at a time, it's most cost effective to finance or borrow for redevelopment and construct as much as possible as quickly as possible. Financing also ensures that redevelopment uses the most efficient methods to build, um, allowing construction bids to capture an economy of scale. So a fairground special district is being proposed to allow uh, for this financing to occur in the most cost effective way possible, which Courtney Ellis um, will talk about in a moment. But from a county budgeting perspective, and Chris can speak to this also, from a county budgeting perspective, it is the most transparent tool to use because a special district will allow a citizen to look at one special district on the budget, see the amount being assessed, see the budget amounts for each project, and see the direct relation between the assessments and the debt service over an extended period of time. In other budgets, uh, the only thing that would remain from year to year would be the debt service amount, which would likely um, just show as a transfer out. So it's pretty confusing stuff, but um, Chris can talk more about it. Uh, oh, well, there's, this is me throwing Chris under the bus. Um, the resolution before you today uh, declares that it's the intent of the Board of County Commissioners to create a fairground special district in order to leverage the mills to finance implementation of the master plan. Upon adopting this resolution, the county will initiate a 60-day uh, public comment period. Following that 60-day window, um, a public hearing will be held prior to the creation of the district. So the next step uh, after the district is created um, will be to work with lenders to secure finance financing. Um, mechanisms could be privately placed loans, or they could be public um, loans like the State Revolving Loan Fund um, that we're looking to do with uh, the utilities. And then, finally, after years of uh, planning and uh, design, we'll begin to see improvements on the ground this spring. So uh, what are those improvements that are going to be associated with this district? Um, we are not going to be able to implement the entire uh, master plan. Um, but phase one, um, a large part of what we're doing in phase one is restoring, renovating, and upgrading. Um, phase one will include full renovations to five historic buildings. Uh, of the buildings um, listed on the historic registrar, the following are being proposed for rehabilitation um, using the special district. Um, the 1915 commercial building, the 1937 culinary building, the fair office, the floriculture building, and the home arts building. Um, and since the fire um, at the fair last year, we've been working closely with the fire department to fast track new concessions with full hoods and fire suppression. Um, phase one will include all new concessions that are up to fire and health code. And we're um, set to break ground on those immediately following the fair this summer with the permission of the fire department. Phase one also includes a new learning center, which will house the Missoula County Extension and Weed District. This LEED certified building will include innovative educational space where family and consumer science, horticulture, plant clinic, and 4-H will provide agricultural programming for county residents. The WEED district will gain much needed workspace to empower local land managers through cooperative uh, landowner and watershed groups to regulate invasive species and improve, and improve plant communities. 4-H um, uh, has operated in Missoula County for over 100 years. They're going to be in the Learning Center also. Um, and since, they've, since 1912, um, it's been intricately involved with uh, the Western Montana Fair and the Missoula Fairgrounds. And now for the first time, they'll have a home of their own on the fairgrounds. So phase one also includes a new maintenance shop that sits on one acre um, on the southern border of the property. The maintenance shop will be for the grounds, or the fairgrounds grounds crew and the county and weed district um, 
and extension office and we are in discussions about leasing some of that space to the city uh, parks and rec department the maintenance shop will be simple um, and will also include outdoor space for garbage and recycling and, and rv dump stations um, phase one also includes much needed utility main extensions and site preparation and grading for the southern half of the fairgrounds. This will include um, preparing the site for future livestock center, rodeo arena, and glacier ice rink. Um, so to be clear, phase one does not include building those buildings, but it does um, do the site work and install utilities um, for, pay for those buildings. Um, so it also uh, will provide um, space for temporary parking and other activities while portions of the fairgrounds are under construction. Um, water and sewer mains will be extended to serve the historic building group, the maintenance building, the future livestock center, the future rodeo grandstands. Um, and with the utility extensions, new fire hydrants and mobile concessions hookups will also be installed. And our overhead utilities will be reloc relocated. So open space and trail enhancements are also scheduled to be completed if we can stretch our dollars. Um, and we are hopeful that we can do that, optimistic. Um, but as I'll show you in the budget in a moment, it is uh, by no means certain. Um, these include the demonstration gardens, the North Carnival grounds, um, commuter trails, the Russell and South um, perimeter landscaping, uh, Russell, sorry, Russell Street and South Avenue perimeters, um, the landscaping there, including irrigation, fencing, lighting, and entrance enhancements. Um, so here are some preliminary cost estimates. Um, Jackson Construction has been selected to help us um, as a GCCM model. So they're not only going to be the general manager for the project, they're also going to consult on design, which helps us make tough choices and stretch our dollars as far as we can. You can see that we have a $4 million gap, um, and primarily that $4 million gap is in constructing open space and trails. We continue to apply for and have been awarded grants uh, for use in some renovation projects, such as the addition of a commercial, uh, an elevator in the commercial building, and are also working with the public and private partners to raise funds for the new trails and open space, and also for buildings um, in future phases, such as the ice rink, livestock center, and rodeo arena. So timeline for this special district process. Um, on the 28th of February, the you guys, the county commissioners, called a public hearing regarding the proposed creation of the special district. And then on March 6th and 13th, the notice was published in the Missoulian. Uh, March 22nd is today. Um, and hopefully you will adopt a resolution of intent uh, of intention to create a special district and uh, call pu calling the public hearing. And then if you do adopt that resolution today, um, on uh, tomorrow, March 23rd, um, then a public notice will be read in the Missoulian of the passage of the resolution of intent. Um, and then on Friday, March 30th, we'll do another notice. Um, and then the public hearing on the creation of the special district would be May 24th. Um, and the Board of County Commissioners will consider the resolution creating the special district at that time. So um, I am going to pass it off to Courtney and she can get wonky on financing for us. Um, I'm here to answer questions and I know there's quite a few people who want to um, uh, uh, testify. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Courtney take over. Thanks, Emily. Courtney? Hi there. Um, hopefully I will not get too wonky, but we'll see. Um, and if you could state your name, please. Sure, yeah. Uh, um, I'm Courtney Ellis. Uh, I'm an attorney at Dorsey and Whitney, uh, and we're bond counsel to the county on this matter. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to explain some of the features um, of the special district statutes and to explain why we uh, recommended using a special district as the financing mechanism for the fairgrounds redevelopment. So first, uh, just to clarify, the special district that we're talking about today is a special district under Title VII, Chapter 11, Part 10 of the Montana Code Annotated. And these are really financing mechanisms similar to a special improvement district, SID, or a rural special improvement district, an RSID. Uh, these are not separate local government entities. Um, like, for example, water and sewer districts, hospital districts, or fire districts. Uh, the special district we're talking about here would be administered by the Board of County Commissioners. It would not have independent authority uh, to levy mills. So when we first started talking to Emily and some of the county staff, we understood that, um, as Emily just explained, 
uh, the county had determined that these fairgrounds improvements are really important uh, and made the determination to levy three mills annually to pay for the improvements. Um, and we were really trying to figure out, you know, and Emily touched on um, really the cost effectiveness of financing the improvements rather than trying to pay cash and do piecemeal improvements year after year. Um, and Courtney, could you pull the mic just a little bit closer? Or, that, sorry. That's okay, thanks. Um, so we were trying to figure out which financing mechanism available to the county would be the best fit in terms of using the revenue from the three mills to finance the cost of the improvements. So I think a very important thing to understand here, and Emily touched on this, but that creating a special district does not increase the number of mills that are levied from the fairground improvements. Uh, in very simple terms, this is just a means for the county to obtain one or more loans uh, to pay for the improvements and then use the revenue from levying the three mills to pay back the loan or the loans. Um, so we considered various methods and particularly focused on creating either an RSID or a series of RSIDs or pursuing creation of a special district. Um, in either case, the fundamental financing would work in the same way. So um, the county would issue bonds and use the proceeds of the bonds to pay for the fairgrounds improvements. The debt service on the bonds would be payable from assessments that the county would levy against the fairgrounds. Uh, since the county owns the fairgrounds, the assessments are against the county's property and not other taxpayers' property. So the county would then pay those assessments, which repay the bonds, from the revenues that it receives from levying these three mills. The main differences between the two models, the RSID and the special district, and the reasons that we thought the special district was a better fit are first, um, generally speaking, to make RSID bonds marketable, the county would need to pledge its RSID revolving fund uh, as security for the RSID bonds, and it would need to deposit 5% of the principal amount of any series of RSID bonds into the revolving fund. Um, this means that the transactional costs of using RSIDs are higher than the transactional costs of a special district. Uh, in other words, using an RSID would just be a more expensive way of financing the same improvements. Um, second, because the fairgrounds are inside city limits, um, as a statutory matter, the city of Missoula would need to be involved in the proceedings to create the RSID or RSIDs in a way that seemed to us to be a little bit onerous or inefficient. Um, and finally, the special district statutes are just a little more flexible than the RSID statutes. Um, in fact, the special district statutes replace statutes um, that previously related to other kinds of districts, including fair districts. Uh, and the special district statutes seem to contemplate being used in situations where the overall project or undertaking is somewhat broader or maybe ongoing. Um, Similar to, you know, here you have a master plan, you have multiple phases of, of um, improvements that you plan on sort of financing over time. Um, in comparison, the RSID statutes are a little more rigid, um, and we typically read them to be designed more for discrete one-time projects. So you could potentially have an RSID for the water and sewer improvements, and then an RSID for some of the um, renovations to historic buildings, and the separate RSID, you know, sort of each piece of the improvements would be separated out that way. Um, so after comparing the RSID mechanism with special districts, we felt that pursuing creation of a special district as a financing mechanism provided a somewhat cheaper, simpler, and more flexible means of financing the fairgrounds improvements. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chris, did you have anything to add uh, since Emily threw you under the bus, I guess, earlier? So. <laughs> Okay, uh, we, we might seek your opinion later. Uh, so this is a public hearing. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, come on up to the mic and uh, state your name for the record if you have any uh, comment. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Bellon. I'm a civil engineer with Territorial Land Works, and I'm also president of the Missoula Midtown Association. And we've seen the county really advance some great planning here and some great concepts, and now we're ready for construction. And the Missoula Midtown um, Board strongly supports creating a special district. You know, we want to see some, some activity out here, some construction. 
we, we've got uh, 80, 86,000 people attending the fairgrounds and we don't really even have adequate sewer and water in the facility. Um, as, a, as an organization, we see um, tremendous economic benefit. Uh, there's just a lot of synergy going on in the district and uh, we've been part of this uh, process. We've facilitated some, some um, public input on some of the design concepts and we just support the funding moving forward. So. Mozilla Midtown Association uh, strongly supports the creation of the district. Thanks, Mark. Additional public comment. Come on up. Mis Mr. Dunham. Thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Dunham, and I am a registered voter and a citizen of Missoula County and Montana State. I am not in opposition to a fairgrounds. And Emily did a great job of explaining why fairgrounds are there and they do a lot of good. When I was a banker here in Missoula in 1970s, I did a many a trip out to the fairgrounds to see the horse races and then some of the side events. So I'm not opposed to the fairgrounds itself, but I am opposed to the method that is being proposed to pay for the fairgrounds. As the Missoulian reported in March 1 of 2018 in the paper, it's a semi-permanent state of debt, which basically no taxpayer has approval or disapproval of. Now, I just heard some conversation here, which I didn't know about, which, if I understand it rightly, is saying that the commissioners are going to have the right to increase the mill funding for these needs as you would desire. If I'm wrong, why well, I can be corrected. Anytime a taxpayer is being, is, monies are being spent, they must have their voice before anything else takes place. So I would hope that the commissioners would take into consideration that nothing can be increased in the mill levies without bringing it forward to the general public and preferably by a vote of the general public. The situation as it sits now, and it allows possibly the misuse of funds without the public approving and knowing about it. Now, I'm going to quote <clears throat> one of our fine commissioners here. With all due respect, Nicole. <laughs> In the paper, it says, you said, I think this is a great solution to be a little more transparent with costs so taxpayers can see what these mills are going to do. I appreciate that comment as it sits. The misuse side of this is possible in that the public itself, once it's being done, will not know what was being done until it's after the fact. So if we, as a general public, desire maybe not to have that type of situation, it's already been done. The water's under the bridge, it's gone. And I understand, and I didn't hear, there's a limitation of up to 10 mils maximum, which I would hope would be written in there saying it cannot be increased without a general vote of the public. My opposition, again, is I believe that the United States came about way back when in the Constitution, before the Constitution, when King George had the colonies under his control. And the King George decided that, well, why don't I have a stamp tax? I'll just do that and we can raise some money. Stamp tax caused our nation, basically one of the reasons our nation was founded. Taxation without representation. No matter what, I believe in a sunset clause and I believe that the taxpayers should all have a right to say and vote for any kind of increases that will affect them. A 10 mil increase on a house that's worth $300,000 would be $100 per one, I mean, $100 per 100, $100 per 100,000. So that'd be $300 annually that this individual tax is going on. 
And I currently know that the school districts are asking for more money. I pay my taxes, thank God, and hopefully I'll still have enough money to continue to pay my taxes. So please consider the public and allow this to have a sunset clause and public vote and public comment. Thank you for your time and I appreciate all your efforts. Thank you, Mr. Dunham. And I will say that uh, um, we do have levy authority already and during the last uh, budget, this current budget year, we allocated three mills for the fairgrounds. Um, uh, and what we're talking, I mean, that could all be spent in one year. What we're talking about now is allocating that for debt service. So it's, it's not that that money has not already been uh, levied. It, it has. Um, Chris, you had something to add? I just wanted to make a point of clarification. The, the And you just did it, Commissioner, but <clears throat> that we are limited at the three mills. That was the ask that was approved by the commission. There has been no discussion of 10 mills, which would be an additional seven mills beyond the current capacity. And that has not been something that's been contemplated by staff or discussed with bond council. So that is outside the current special district consideration. Yeah, that's the first I'd heard of 10 mills. Um, also to add in there, the three mills would be included in the district as well as the half a mill for weed and half a mill for, um, so we currently, and we've done those half mills totaling one mill for weed and extension for many years. Um, and again, this is just putting that in the district so you can see that that's been there, but that's been, those, that mill has been there for many years. Um, and Chris, just for the record, could you maybe clarify a little bit about um, mill caps and when votes are required by the public for expenditure of government funds? So I can make an attempt, but I may have to defer to John. So John. If, if the county were to reach its mill cap, which the county is not near uh, at this point, then any additional mills raised beyond that would be required to go to a vote. Or if the county were looking at a mill specifically dedicated for something, so as an example, if the county wanted to create a separate public safety mill, perhaps to fund jail improvements or things like that, the commission could draft bond langu or language which would put those mills uh, before the voters as a separate vote. Those do not count towards the county's mill cap that is set in state law uh, for the purpose of general government. They would be dedicated specifically to that, do not count towards the mill cap, and those usually, they can be in perpetuity if not drafted that way, but are usually drafted with a, a time certain that they expire. Okay. Um, can we come back to you? Okay. Uh, we might have additional commentary, but not to keep you standing there too much longer. Uh, thank you. Go ahead and state your name for the record. My name is Rocky Sainert. I have some written comments. Would you like those after or now? Uh, you can hand them to uh, Sarah right now. That's fine. I disagree with the bond council that special districts are merely of the kind that the fair would be just a decision between what kind of financing to have. I've read the statutes. I spent all day yesterday typing up this and trying to understand what's going on here. You're asked to vote on whether or not to commence the process of a special district. All the testimony you heard was why the fair was a good thing. You didn't hear any substantive argument except perhaps what the bond council said as to why a special district allows you to do things at the fairgrounds that isn't currently possible. Transparency was one of the, the key words used, but I think it's, this is far from transparent. I looked up that special district law, and typically a special district is composed of mostly private property, although government entities can be assessed as well. And private property has owners, and you're supposed to send out a letter if you're proposing one of these things to all the owners. They have a right to protest. The protest limit is very low, 11% of either the people affected or the property affected. And then if that is a protest is six, count at 11%, then you have to hold an election to establish a special district. It doesn't exempt fair districts from those things. So this is a really unique proposal. You've got a special district 
that has non-taxable property in it that is going to be assessed by the state, I guess, as a courtesy, as if it were private property, you'll get a valuation and then you, the commissioners, will assess yourselves the property that you own, the sole property within that district, and you will derive some sort of a payment, which right now apparently generates about 890 something thousand dollars a year at three mills. I want to stop right now and ask, is that a new three mills or was that a reassignment? Uh, new last year. Yeah, we adopted three mills within the fiscal year 18. Budget. So an additional so three mills. Last year. That's within this current year's budget. Emily, yeah, you I mean, just a clarification: the 890 is actually four mills. It's 670 uh, thousand is three mills. 890 is four. That includes the Wee District and County Extension. Okay, okay, it was thank on you. The tax bill this November already. Mm, yeah, but the point is, is that you're, the argument is being made that we won't see a tax increase. We already have a tax increase for this fair proposal it just didn't happen in the context of the special district and i you know you're talking 21 million dollars in improvements six foot six hundred and something thousand dollars on a 20-year bond how that's you per can year huh that's per year per, that, you, that you think you can pay off 21 million dollars in 20 years with 600 and something thousand a year no, i think that's that's not I think your math accurate. is a little we're, wrong. We're doing <laughs> 21 million at a time. Well, but you, know, no, you we, see we, what I'm saying? I do not understand the benefit to having the special district, and I don't think you got any clear, cogent arguments from either the fair director or the council as to why it's needed. What in the world are you going to do with this thing that you couldn't already do? You can already pass all the bonds you want to spend on the fairgrounds. All you need is a little better accounting, it sounds like, to pick out the particular pieces and make a report. People can read that just as easily as they could read something that said special district fairgrounds. It's not separate. I'm, Emily, maybe you could address this question. Or, well, <laughs> well, well, Emily, why don't you hold that thought and let, let's let this the gentleman like finish. And we'll come back to answer that here in a second. That seems like an awful we'll tortured way to get some financing when you, I mean, maybe there is a way you know some explanation but you know this is all about procedural due process the other part of due process is substantive and there have been no substantive arguments outside of the council's thought that a special district that's for a fair is just a choice between an rsid and a bond the whole idea is that people who are of Affected are going to have their property tax to pay for a special district should have the right to protest. The way you've structured this, there is no private property in the district, yet every piece of property in the county is going to be taxed and already is being taxed to pay for what goes on in the district. That's totally disingenuous. I mean, that, you know, you want to talk about transparency? Let's be transparent now. I, I recommend that you do not pass this thing right now because it it's stinky. It really is. So the item before us is to pass a resolution of intentions. We exactly. Are not, we are not forming the district today. I understand. But who is there to protest? No one. The county is the owner of the property that could protest. You're going to send yourselves a letter noticing this. You see, it's circular. It's because we have the ability to levy the mills because we're under our mill cap. And well, so we, which is why we added it to the budget in 2017, because we have the authority to levy that millage. And so, okay. so it's not that we're trying to stop people from protesting by creating a district, because there's no protest provision necessary when we raise millage under our mill cap. I understand, but yeah, you're starting to see how confusing it is. The protest I'm referring to is the one that is related to the property within the special district. You own the only property in the special district. It's a totally atypical situation from what I think the legislature would have wanted in a state that really hates taxation. The idea that you know, the people who are going to pay for the actions, what you've done is taken the, the property that's going to be taxed to pay for it. <laughs> out, 
out of the equation. Okay. We got Thank you. Time. Thank you. Uh, well, I hope you do something about it. I mean, this is, you're asking for a lawsuit is what you're doing, and it's really unfair that we have to proceed this way in order just to get you to follow the letter, if, the spirit and the letter of the law. Okay, there may be a difference of opinion here. Thank you for your comments. Uh, additional comment, come on up. My name is Jim Sadler. I live at um, 1220 Clements Road. I've been involved uh, with the fair for over 25 years. Um, Missoula has been known as the Garden City since the days of uh, uh, the, mi uh, the mining districts over in Butte. We, we raised uh, vegetables here uh, to send, send over there. Uh, one famous uh, uh, farming event in, in Missoula County was when President Roosevelt showed up in 1905 to inaugurate his uh, farm to uh, market uh, program, which we uh, started out in the Orchard Homes area. Uh, wh where uh, small farms were created uh, to support um, uh, um, uh, locally grown food. And it's one of the reasons why he's on Mount Rushmore is because of these uh, progressive policies. The, the, um, the, the uh, gardening and uh, farming communities are, are, have been involved with our uh, Western Fair for over 100 years. They uh, bring their produce and so forth in for, uh, to show it off and, and to make sure that people have, um, have a way to uh, uh, prove um, uh, their, their abilities. I, I've been involved with the fair um, uh, first as a superintendent. I served on your committee that uh, looked for the various uh, solutions when, and the evaluations of the fair. I think I was on for four or five years. And then I'm presently on the uh, fair events um, uh, committee. The Everyone that I uh, uh, speak with about the upcoming um, uh, um, proposals and, and and how the affair is developing are very excited. We are we are going to have a uh, finally a, a a place in which will be a landmark and a, uh, a going to be a gem created in Midtown Missoula. Uh, first of all, the the, uh, the fair over the years has been uh, turned into a kind of a second rate rate. Uh, um, a place, uh, everything is kind of uh, semi-falling down if it hasn't fallen down. Uh, the county commissioners in the past have never really uh, recognized uh, the fair as the, um, as the, um, the, the, the vehicle it could be to, to help uh, agriculture and farming. But uh, and I want to co commend this commission for uh, having the foresight to uh, uh, create the process uh, to allow the fair to um, uh, to recreate itself. There, uh, if, if you notice the maps that were shown, there's going to be a wonderful walking paths uh, through the. Um, uh, th through the uh, the fairgrounds, uh, it, the remodeling will attract uh, uh, people and and business. It will be a rejuvenation uh, of the of the midtown. The um, the comments on the uh, on the way to um, uh, finance it uh, that is true. They are innovative, but it allows the uh, uh, the the use of the six hundred or the seven hundred thousand, whatever that sum is, to be pledged uh, uh, to pay off the bonds, because you need uh, uh, you cannot build a building at six hundred thousand. Uh, you could only do six hundred thousand dollar buildings for so many years. Uh, there's more more is needed when a, a large sum is available to do this remodeling, um, and so I encourage the uh, the commissioners to um, to uh, approve this. It's going to be a wonderful thing for Missoula, and and I want to compliment you on on your foresight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sadler. Uh, additional public comment on the resolution of intention to create a special fair district. Come on up. Don't be shy. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, Eric Gabster. Um, I'm a, a resident of Midtown, a member of the uh, board of the Midtown Association, and uh, also 
a, a member of the uh, same uh, group that uh, Jim was on for a number of years. In its first three years, uh, I was on the uh, Fairground Advisory Committee. Um, so it is uh, with, uh, uh, I, I guess, great uh, anticipation that I will recommend to the Commission that uh, this is voted on and can move forward. Um, in the early days of the Fairground Advisory Committee, we had uh, a lot of issues in the weeds to deal with different, many different stakeholders than, than even exist now on the fairgrounds. Uh, we had the issue of horse racing to address. We had the issue of uh, landscaping and integration with the community and, and a lot of things that um, filled our time and, and uh, we struggled with. And I guess to Emily's point, um, master planning did take a long time and I, I guess it was about eight years ago when we, when we got started with this, this iteration of it. Um, I think everyone was, was very aware through that time that um, there were great uh, and large issues that many people did not know needed to be addressed. Uh, there's, you know, wooden water pipes in the backfield, and there's uh, septic, and there's stuff that nobody really wants to deal with. And all of that, in order to protect this gem of a property in Midtown, uh, needs to be addressed and can't be dealt with piecemeal. Um, the Midtown Association Board is very aware of the uh, economic development that's going on in Midtown, and uh, one of the key components uh, that will be amplified is to have the kind of programming that um, has reached the final recommendation that is approaching the commissioners this spring and uh, will really build out a year-round uh, facility uh, almost with nightly events going on and uh, make uh, Midtown a destination not only for people in the city and the county but, uh, but the region as well. And it's the kind of economic development that Midtown is uh, anticipating to see and, and has begun to see uh, more strongly in the last few years and this would be an incredible contribution from the county to be able to support that in many more ways than, than just the commercial ones that are happening along Brooks and around the, the Midtown and county areas. Um, as a neighborhood uh, resident, I, I have to appreciate the ways that the final design integrates in with the neighborhood uh, with, with trails and accessibility. Um, the, uh, the, the safer way to not only cross that entire space, which people always did, uh, you know, with or without fences uh, in place, uh, but the ability to um, uh, cross that uh, area and, and to reach Playfair Park or to reach another neighborhood, it was just uh, nice to see that this was going to be a place that um, I didn't have to wait to the fair to go and to enjoy. I, I could uh, you know, walk over and, and find a green space and hopefully the 4-H cafe is going to be open more than just a fair time uh, in the future and I could grab a sandwich and a cup of coffee in the afternoon. It's, um, it's a way that this uh, 100 and, uh, or excuse me, 47 acres can uh, really become part of the community in a much bigger way than it is now. And um, it is uh, never an easy thing to answer the question that we faced in the early years. We had all these ideas. We didn't know where is the money going to come from. And there was no really popular or easy way to answer that question. And uh, uh, it, it has become even more difficult with uh, some uh, larger economic realities these days. So to have a, a solution that is elegant and simple uh, and does not increase taxes um, and uh, still leaves the ability of any citizen in Missoula County to go and talk to the board when taxes or mills are considered, um, I, I think is uh, one that needs to uh, be paid attention to, uh, uh, reach more public discussion and hopefully um, be voted on in the future. The board of the Missoula Midtown Association uh, supports it. And although the uh, Missoula uh, Fairground Advisory Committee uh, no longer exists, uh, it is the kind of solution that we had hoped for uh, for those many years. So um, uh, it is uh, uh, the early toil, I feel, is paying itself off. And uh, now that we have uh, the kind of leadership in place to be able to carry it forward and make it happen, um, I, I know there's uh, great hope and anticipation that this will move forward. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Gabster. Uh, additional public comment. One bite at the apple, Larry. Nope. Come on up. <clears throat> uh, Jerry Marks, I'm with the Extension Office. Um, address is 2825 Santa Fe Court. I've been involved with the fairgrounds <clears throat> many years, about 48 now. Um, we started a process in early 2000 to build a learning center. Uh, and have accumulated some dollars uh, and has been mentioned some millage has been added to that effort uh, it was recommended by the commissioners we moved to the fairgrounds I was about 2010 
Uh, and we encourage that to be part of a process to put together a plan for the fairgrounds, which we have gone through. It was a struggle at times, but it happened. Um, and I've been involved in many meetings. Uh, uh, it would be about two and a half years ago, had what over 20 meetings in various groups uh, throughout the county. And certainly there was a lot of concerns expressed, but also a lot of enthusiasm that, hey, we're finally moving ahead with the fairgrounds. And as Emily has mentioned at our displays uh, during fair week, we've gotten a lot of positive comments that finally uh, we're moving ahead. Uh, we're in the process now of completing uh, some kind of building design and we'll hopefully have a cost estimate in front of the county commission for consideration by June and we'd like to move ahead. I appreciate the effort that has gone through to come up with some way that we can stretch a few dollars both from contributions and the mill levy to try to make this happen. Thank you and I support the effort. Thank you Mr. Marks. Is there additional public comment? Come on up. Hello, I'm Campbell Barrett. I also work with the County Extension Office, specifically with the 4-H Youth Program. I'll make a couple of brief comments. Hopefully one of our 4-H parents who's in the room will have some more eloquent things to say. But So the 4-H Youth Program is open to all youth in Missoula County. Currently about 400 kids participate. Um, Emily mentioned that the kids haven't had a home at the fairgrounds at least since we tore down livestock barns to build ice rinks about 20 years ago. Um, the ice folks have been great hosts and we have a great relationship with them. Um, but our folks would love to have a place to call their own at the fairgrounds. Um, I've attended those planning meetings since the first one that I attended was December of 2008. 10 years ago in, in uh, Crandall or Rambula times. And it is exciting to see us finally, I hope, moving forward with fairgrounds progress. And unless you have questions, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, additional public comment. Come on up. And Clarence Wildemore, thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm excited to hear about and eager to see uh, continued progress on the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds has become a very valuable place for our family. My wife, Laura, and I are the proud parents of four boys who are 4-H members and hockey players and ice skaters and youth referees. Studies have shown the value of 4-H. The fairgrounds as a supporting resource for 4-H programming is to, truly an enabler to helping us continue to develop young people who are historically more likely to be civically involved and active who experience greater educational achievements, have greater motivation and aspirations for future education, and they're nearly twice as likely to go to college. Thank you for making 4-H supporting resources and facilities a priority on the fairgrounds. Additionally, team sports, including curling, figure skating, and hockey are valuable, providing consistent exercise while developing relationships that young people have to learn to navigate. Team sports help build confidence in participants and help put winning into perspective while recognizing individual team members' skills and roles. Thank you for supporting Missoula Ice Sports on the fairgrounds. Both 4-H and team sports teach and value respect for teammates, leaders, opponents, coaches, and referees. 4-H and sports share a common theme in valuing family involvement through participation as leaders, coaches, fans, and even as healthy competitors. Looking forward to increased support for our young people our future leaders through resources and facilities at the fairgrounds is exciting. Thank you for your work on that mission for today's youth and tomorrow's youth and families. Thank you. Additional public comment. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will close the public hearing. Um, Emily, do you want to uh, address any of the points you've heard? Uh, sure. One point uh, that I heard was that once you create the district, the commissioners will have no oversight um, and that maybe county staff could spend the money freely. Actually, the way we've written the GCCM contract, which is the general um, the 
construction contract. Um, when we get bids in and agree on a guaranteed maximum price, we come to the commission with that guaranteed maximum price for a contract amendment. So every time we bite off a big chunk, we will be coming to the commission uh, to approve to approve those those costs um, before we start spending that money on construction. Um, the other uh, point I want to make is that um, we're not trying to. We of course we don't think we can leverage six hundred thousand dollars to get twenty million. That's not um, that's not our you know that's not our goal. We um, the phase one is is twenty million. We do have a gap in it, and it doesn't build new buildings. It doesn't build the new rodeo arena. It doesn't build the new livestock center, and it doesn't build the new. Um, um, hockey rinks or ice ice rinks. What it does do is it takes care of what we have, and it's it it we, we're really spending the money to um, be stewards of what we have in terms of the historic resources and the utilities. And um, it does have some new buildings too, like the for the the learning center and the maintenance building and the concessions. But um, this this phase one is really focused on showing the community that we can take care of the fairgrounds and uh, and um, hopefully um, building trust with them um, and our ability to to maintain it and and be good stewards. So I look forward to um, continuing to work to raise private dollars for the new facilities. We have great stakeholders in rodeo and in, uh, in iSports and in uh, livestock arena. Um, and I'm uh, confident that we'll move move those projects forward, um, even though they're not part of this phase. Um, so, Emily or Chris, uh, so w what what does uh, four mils worth of um, debt service get us in terms of total cost? Uh, well, you know the value of the mill changes, um, and it, like went up last year. Um, rough estimate about. Fourteen million dollars. Right. So there's no expectation that 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 millage will cover no. twenty million dollars. So that's there's gaps, and our our cost estimates do have a twenty five percent contingency. So um, we're hoping that you know the numbers will come in lower. Our cost, you know, for example, you see we have set aside or we have we haven't set aside. We have a budgeted one point four million for site grading. Well, we just got our cost estimates from Jackson yesterday and it came in at um, 1.01 .01. so that's great news you know that's that hasn't been bid yet that's just they're honing in on it so hopefully some of these numbers will go down and it will free up some more uh, money we're also looking to uh, partner with um, um, like the on the streetscape and some of the some of the items that are el eligible for TIF funding we're hoping to um, have um, help from the city on that. We are backing off our request to move into the, the TIF district. Um, we think there's enough improvements that can be made, um, enough improvements that can be made um, without moving into the district, like the streetscape and some of the connecting infrastructure that um, given the uh, um, other needs in the district, we're, we're happy to partner with the city without moving into the TIF district, so. Thank you. Questions from the commission? I just wanted to make a, a clarification for the folks that feel like they don't have any say on the budget. So um, the commission is elected to adopt a budget each year. It does have to be a balanced budget in Montana, thank goodness, as does the state budget. So we can't, um, we can't commit money that we don't have the revenue to pay for. Um, but there is a public process for that. We have um, usually the, toward the end of July, we have um, the preliminary budget drafted, and it says right in it, like it did last year, um, where the money's going. And last year, we added these three mills, um, knowing that, um, that we had a great plan and that we had someone on board to carry out the plan. Um, and um, community members that had been involved all along so there is, there's that point, and then we wait to see what the mill value is that we get from the Department of Revenue, and we actually adopt the budget that could be tweaked a little bit between the preliminary and the final budget based on what the, the mill, value of the mill is. So there is a process. I'd hope that we seldom have very many people come um, to 
to give us input. So there is a process for you to give input on the county's um, budget. And we also, um, our budget is online. If you ever want to go see where money is getting spent, um, it's all there. Um, or we have, um, if you don't have access to online, we have hard copies that you can come into our office and, and see. So I just want to make sure that people understood that it is our requirement by law to do that. Um, we have to live within our means, which is money that you all contribute. And then, um, and we have a process to allow you to have input, so thanks. And just to follow on that, we can right now during our, our budget deliberations um, increase taxes within our statutory mill cap. Um, and uh, that is not subject to public protest other than at the ballot box. Uh, Commissioner Rowley. I guess kind of building on, on those concepts, it's, it's unfortunate that government budgeting and financing is so complex. Um, and so people get, I think it's easy to get wrapped up in um, thinking we're doing one thing when we're doing another. Um, and, and I think that really, even in the, the complexity of government financing, when you look at this, um, it actually is the simplest, most elegant solution. And I think it's very creative and I'm excited. And I think that we have very good legal advice from Dory and Courtney and John that, that, you know, I think we're being creative absolutely within the law um, and it's allowing us to do amazing things. And so, um, um, so I, I suppose to the, to the public, it's, it's unfortunate that it's difficult to understand. And I apologize to, to people ha who have difficulty, um, but I do feel that, it, that the opposition is born out of a misunderstanding um, and that this is, this is a really great solution. Thanks. I, I do have a question. I'm not sure if this is best uh, posed to Courtney or Chris or Emily. So um, by virtue of creating a district like this, and, and I think this probably is at the root of, of some of the, the concerns we've heard from folks, would um, any, any mills levied to pay for the, uh, the assessments uh, be outside of our mill cap or not? All of the mills would be inside your mill cap. They would not be outside. If you were to look for an outside, you would have to go to a vote. Of the Even in the case of paying for um, assessments for a special district? That is correct. Okay. Um, and uh, again, to address some of the concerns I've heard would uh, would either Courtney or Chris or Emily like to take another swing at uh, succinctly describing what it is that this district does that through other bonding mechanisms we would uh, not have as favorable terms. Well I'll frame it up and then I, I think Courtney and Chris are the best people to answer it but I'll frame it up by saying there's it does two things. One is it allows us to finance um, in a way that is more cost effective. It, the transactional costs are lower and Courtney can speak to that. And then the other, the second thing is that in the county budget, it's actually gonna be found in one place for people to view. If you think of, Chris can think of, I'm here, here's me throwing Chris under the bus. Which, what, like, what's an example of a special district in the county budget where rather than just showing debt service and just one line that says debt service, it will actually list out the, those pieces. So I'll let Chris answer the county budget piece and then Courtney can speak to um, the transactional costs. Thank you. And, Chris. and I apologize, I may cross a little bit into Courtney's lane when doing this. So if you think of the other special improvement districts that you have, most of which are rural special improvement districts, they <coughs> are used to finance a, a variety of different projects, but let's just pick one that's relatively common, which would be a sewer or water project. So perhaps the Lolo uh, sewer and water district, which is a different mechanism under state law, but when it, it looks for bonding, it, it works similarly. Um, those, when those bonds occur, when we incur that debt, that continues to stay in just one section of the budget, which is the Lolo Sewer and Water District. And there's a page in our budget book that shows that. It shows the cost that went out. It shows the debt service that goes with that. When we finance other capital projects with other mechanisms, let's say the purchase of new voting equipment, and we use a, tradition, a, a different financing mechanism to do that, all that shows up in the elections budget after the initial year when that purchase occurs is a transfer out to the debt service fund. So there's no connection between the project or the piece that we bought 
and then the debt service that goes with that that goes on into time beyond the initial year's budget. You'll, you'll continue to see the debt service, but trying to track it back to a project, if you're just looking at our budget book, is, is more complicated. By, by putting this into something like a special district like the Lolo and Sewer Water District, which is a different financing mechanism, which is why I'm kind of crossing lanes a little bit on Courtney there, it keeps those things in one section of the budget in perpetuity. So when we go to look at the Fairgrounds Special District, should the commission create it, the costs associated with the renovations for those buildings and the debt service associated with those costs will remain in the one category of the budget. And so from a ease of finding or a transparency or a continuity piece that stays in that one location from the time that we start until the district goes away. Okay, thank you. Courtney, come on up. Oh. I was going to ask, does each, how closely does it track each separate project? Will we have separate project codes for each yes. project within yes. phase one, which I think is a benefit yes. too, because otherwise if we had multiple projects, all that debt service is just lumped and it just says, yep debt that's service exactly of millions right. of dollars and, mm -hmm. and you don't know what you're even funding out of it. So That's correct, yes. So there will be uh, what we call project codes that kind of elucidate that part. Courtney. Um, hi there. I will take a stab at um, clarifying a little bit more. Sure. Let Michael a little closer. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll take a stab at this. So um, as someone mentioned uh, earlier in testimony, uh, Montana is a pretty conservative state in terms of debt and taxation. Um, local government borrowing is, you know, you need to have express authority under a statute for a local government borrowing to be valid. So here when we're saying you know, you guys have levied, uh, you commissioners have levied under the mill cap a certain number of mills. Uh, so the, this is the finite amount of available funds. If we want to leverage those funds by borrowing, we need to find um, a statutory authorization that fits very well what we're trying to do. So RSIDs are pretty um, are, are a pretty good fit in that respect. Um, you know, again, the the mechanism works the same with a special district as an RSID, so that might be, um, you know, kind of torturing people's minds. And I agree that it's a little funny to think about the county assessing itself, um, but it's it's really just as a means of accessing this um, this finite amount of money that's been set aside for this purpose. Um, there are other tools uh, that the county could have could use. Um, uh, for example, you can do, uh, <laughs> you can issue bonds for particular purposes, for single purposes under the mill cap. Um, you can also uh, do non-appropriation lease financing. Um, you know, again, these are, <laughs> these are means of borrowing with no public hearing required, with no, you know, public notice provision. This really has a much more, um, you know, sort of public process requirement uh, than these other avenues that the county could have chosen. Um, I think that for the purposes that, or for the reasons that Emily and Chris were saying about in terms of um, having some transparency, having a, having some transparency in the budget, um, this is this is one of the means that the county is authorized to use to finance um, improvements using this particular finite pot of money. Um, and from my perspective, it is sort of the most process heavy. <laughs> I don't know if that so, answers so the question. So, Courtney, I mean, beyond the, the tracking piece of uh, and transparency piece, are there better finance terms available through a district as opposed to some other bonding mechanism. Bonding through the district, I guess, I should right. say. Um, I do think that there, in terms of marketability, I think that there's an advantage here probably, uh, you know, using either a special district financing, RSID, or, um, uh, you know, a limited tax general obligation bond, as we would call these sort of non-voted under the mill cap bonds um, as opposed to a lease purchase financing. Here though, I do think that the purchaser of any bond is going to look through to the county's credit and see that the county um, is an excellent risk. Uh, the county, um, you know, 
consistently is under its mill levy cap, is a really good steward of public funds, and so has a very good general obligation bond rating by rating companies. And that, you know, so I think that a purchaser would be able to look through and evaluate the credit just based on the county, the strength of the county. Okay, thank you. Additional questions from the commission? Motion? Well, I'm very excited to, to be here. Even though I haven't been on the Board of County Commissioners a long time, it feels like a long time, and it feels like we've been dealing with the fairgrounds a long time. I was part of the, uh, the fairgrounds advisory committee. I very much appreciate everyone else who sat on that with me. It was a difficult process at times, but we brought that through and we got this plan forward. Um, and of course, with the intent that we would move forward with doing this, and I think that we found an elegant way to move forward with utilizing our existing millage to finance this. Um, and and so excited to have the phenomenal leadership of Emily <laughs> because I don't think this this none of, none of this would be happening without the right leadership in this position. And we're very lucky to to have her leadership um, to help us to begin to actualize the vision that we have for this amazing property. Um, so I'm very happy to move that we adopt a resolution of intent to create a special district for the purpose of undertaking, operating, and maintaining improvements to the Missoula County Fairgrounds and financing the costs thereof and incidental thereto through the issuance of special district bonds. I'm very pleased to second that motion. I have been here a little while longer than you, but um, it, it has been the last few years with that committee's help to really get through and get, I mean, government does seem very slow sometimes, but we're slow and deliberate on purpose because we want to make sure we're doing the right thing with the taxpayers' money and making sure that we have a great transparent public process. And we've done that, and this is awesome, and I'm excited to vote. So is that the second? That was. Okay, that was a second. Uh, yeah, I think I think the time has come to bite the bullet and move forward uh, with uh, um, making sure that we are good stewards of the fairgrounds into the 21st century. Uh, what's before us today is not to create the district. It is a resol resolution of intent to do so. So if folks have additional comment over the next uh, few weeks before the when are we to? Days. 60 days um, I would encourage them to do so um, I do th though think that uh, this is the right path to be on and it uh, is within our levy authority so it is not uh, creating any additional uh, opportunity for us to levy taxes above and beyond our mill levy cap that we're already uh, authorized to do. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That begins the 60-day period. Thank you, Emily. Okay. Uh, that concludes our public hearings today. I saw a couple of folks from our Office of Emergency Management walk in. Were you here uh, for the fairgrounds or for something else? Okay, very good. Um, so uh, again, uh, at 5.30 p.m. today, there will be a public uh, meeting and, uh, and uh, open house related to the uh, Community Wildfire Protection Plan. I'd invite you to come back or just hang out here and be ready for it at 5.30. Uh, so in, in the meantime, uh, uh, that concludes all of our business unless there's anything else. So we will uh, stand in recess.